so this is the Super Bowl of Sundays in the church, right? He is risen. Let's say it together. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I got an over-under game. You can play, with, play by yourself or with, you know, turn to each other and make a bet. Every time I point to you, because it's going to be interaction, great. Every time I point to you, double point, because I do this sometimes. Double point, you're going to say, he is risen. So let's try it. But I don't want you to, I need you to yell it. And if you're at home, I want you to yell. I want your neighbors wondering what is happening over in that house. All right, so every, any time at all. So you got to be watching. I do this. Yes. Okay, that was pretty weak. I'm going to judge you. Compa- I'm telling you, there's a lot of people. Um, but anyway, we're going to do that. Uh, we are in a new sermon series. Um, it is called uh, Finding Fullness. And it's, we're going to talk through John 10. And, you know, he says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what Jesus says. But I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And the only way he can say that and actually offer that is because he rose from the dead. So we're going to talk about what is life to the full? What does it look like? How can I grab that? Um, And and you're going to have an opportunity to do that because Jesus died and literally rose from the dead. Right? It's the miracle of miracles. It's the resurrection, the historical base upon which all Christian doctrines are built, the proof, thank you so much, Sam, that death is not the end of this life. It's the reason the first church started and why we still gather uh, years and years and years and years and years later. The single most important astonishing fact, an event in the world history. He is alive. Okay, the over-under is I'm going to give it nine. I don't know. I'm gonna, every time I write it in here, I'm going to say it. So you can bet yourselves over, under, so far, that's where it's counted. We're, we're at two. Okay, make your bets. All right. So, but it makes everything that we talk about here, every sermon, every, every saying on the wall back in the, the kids' area, everything we teach our kids, every praise song, every hallelujah, everything that we do, every prayer spoken, every service project, go local, every dime we bring in, Every uh, dollar club video is empty without the empty tomb. Yeah, this guy's got it. So like, here's what Jesus says to Martha outside the tomb of Lazarus before he raises him. And listen to this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will, will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So I'm going to ask you, do you believe this? Yes. I mean, do you, do you really believe? Yes. So maybe you're sitting there going, I think so. I'm going to ask you again in about 20, 30 minutes after I do this speech to think about that. So I grew up in the church, Methodist church in New Martinsville. We sat in the pew right over there, fifth row back on the end, granddad, grandma, me, my brother, my mom, my dad when he wasn't fishing. <laughs> Uh, we thought those were reserved seats, and then Easter would come, and we're like, hey, people were in our seats. What do we do? And my grand would be like, it's fine, we'll sit somewhere else, and we would just sit awkwardly. And then we're like, hey, we have, like today, we're like, hey, we have seats. I'm like, dude, no one knew wants to sit in the front row, right? Anyway, there's three right here if you want. Um, anyway, um, but uh, that's the thing. And so here's what I remember from I, I remember a lot. I had to cut a bunch of stuff. My sermon was 50 minutes when I first went through it. Didn't figure you wanted to sit here that long. Uh, but here's the one thing. That, there's two things I remember about Easter. One is, I don't know why I remember this. If it rains on Easter, does anybody know this? Then for the next seven Sundays, it rains. Did, who buys that? So I know you're going to raise your hand. Yeah. I, it's, let's see if it happened. It rained today. So supposedly for the next seven Sundays, so every Easter, I'm like, it's going to rain. I'm like, why, is, why do I think about that? The other thing I think about is white pants, suspenders, and matching with my brother. Here's a picture. This is what we look like every year. Now, we don't have suspenders on because we had stripes ridiculous. We did that until we were in college. My mom made us. I'm just kidding. It was, it was high school, but. But see, growing up in the church, I believed in this stuff, I think. But it took a good while for me to actually start living it. And, and, and that's the invitation, really, I want to give every single person here today. An opportunity. It's been there the whole time. An invitation to living life to the full. And, and maybe that's why you're here this morning. Seriously. 
Maybe that's why you kind of came through these doors to say, I'm in. Maybe your next step is to say, I believe. So I want to take a good look at uh, the first few witnesses that actually were there. And, and how did they react? What did they see? How did they think about this? So I'm going to pray for us and we'll get into it. Lord, thanks for today. I pray, Lord, that we would uh, hear from you. You would speak and that we would hear for you. That, you would, that we would walk here out of here just a, a little changed because of you. A little different because of you. Thank you for this opportunity in your name. Amen. Okay, so there are, not counting Paul, about 11 recordings, recorded times that Jesus appeared to people. He appeared to, you know, individuals, couples. He was inside, outside groups, big crowds. Um, he was visually seen, audibly heard. He ate food with folks. And here's the thing, though. None of these witnesses believed that Jesus would rise from the dead. None of them. They didn't, they didn't buy it. Why? Here's, what it, here's why, I think. It takes me to this one word that I texted Matt. I said, here's a good word. This will preach, is what I told him. The word is assume. They all assumed Jesus couldn't rise from the dead. And maybe for good reason, right? That sounds nuts. We all assume. All the time. That's what we do for some reason. Some are good, some are bad. Most of the time, I assume kind of the worst of people, right? They're, they're trying to get at me. They're trying to do something. I, but that's all assumptions. And, you know, I'd say more often than not, it brings me stress, worry, anxiety, anger. And, and this is stuff that's self-inflicted, pain-inducing, inner turmoil that I'm making up myself. Anybody been there? Yeah, we assume. We have a broken relationship, and it had to do with just assuming. It's ridiculous, but we do that. And I think the same is what happened with this. So I texted this word to Matt. I said, here's the thing. That'll preach on a Sunday, maybe even on Easter. And he goes, okay. And then three weeks later, he goes, hey, man, you're on. I'm like, on for what? <laughs> Easter Sunday. And he goes, dude, I'm like, I have one line. <laughs> Jesus, here's my line. I said, Jesus died, and that's it. He goes, yeah, you, that'll be great. So I wrote, Jesus died and that's it. Dot, dot, dot. Nope. Then I started typing. So this is what you're going to hear. Jesus died and that's it. Nope. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at this. Uh, John, uh, we're going to be in John 20. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we're going to break it down verse by verse and talk about it. Verse 1, early on the first day of the week. While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Okay, there are three time references here, and I think it matters. The first day of the week, very early in the morning, while it was still dark. So I think it's significant because of what was actually happening in these last hours. Like on this week's first day, on this morning's first dawning, as the crown of this weekend of weekends, we have the beginning of the first day and of the first year of the risen Lord's reign. Interesting. That time reference in there. And every Sunday since, people that have said, I believe, are gathering somewhere, somehow, to rejoice in this empty tomb. And here we are today in the church, gathering again because of this crazy miracle. So verse 2 says, So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. So you're saying, why, why all this? Why, why the running to see or thinking what's going on, the chaos? Because they assumed there's no way he actually rose from the dead. This can't be, this is impossible, right? Wrong. As is the outcome of a lot of our assumptions. A lot of people assumed on October 14th, 2005 in Morgantown at Mountaineer Field <laughs> against Louisville, anybody who was at that game, triple overtime win, who left early, be honest, I did not, my wife was pregnant, pregnant, she begged to leave, I said no, <laughs> I said you're fine. 
even though Laura's punishment, she thinks God's punishment, I don't think it's very theologically sound, but she says God's punishment to her is overtime. In any sport, that's God's punishment. So we're triple overtime. Everybody leaves. It's an empty stadium, was it not? And we came back and won. Everybody left and missed it because they assumed that we would lose. Uh, pretty good assumption. I mean, it's the Mountaineers. Uh, <laughs> what are the things of God, Jesus, Easter, the cross, the church, that you assume, maybe wrongly, and you miss out? You're missing out because you assume it's not for you. It's a good question to think about. I've been reading, I, I just finished the book of Genesis. Ted and I are reading this crazy thing. We're going through the book, of the, we're going through the whole Bible in three years. I don't know if we'll stick with it or not. So far, so good. Three months in. All right. Genesis, and I'm reading Luke. Here's the thing. Listen to this. I'm just going to wrap through these. Here's some assumptions made. Uh, they're in the boat with Jesus, the disciples, and they say, Master, we're going to drown. He goes, no, you're not. Watch this. The widow's son was dead in a coffin at his funeral. And Jesus says, no, you're not. Watch this. Lazarus in the tomb for four days. No, 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 you're not. Watch this. They're like, Jesus, you can't. No, watch this. The Virgin Mary will have a son through the Holy Spirit. Watch this. The feeding of the 5,000. Literally, they said, we cannot feed all these people with five loaves and two fish. And I think Jesus said, you want to bet? <laughs> bet me. Bet me right now. I dare you to bet me. Watch this. God tells Abraham and Sarah, hey, you're going to have a child. And they, in two separate occasions, they laugh. And I think God's going, hey, why are you laughing? You're 90, 100, 200, 400, I don't care. Nothing is impossible for me. And he says that. I could go on and on and on, but here's the biggest assumption that everybody made that Jesus did not rise from the dead. That's impossible. But Jesus. is somebody counting? I don't know. All right, okay, continuing. Both, okay, verse four. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. So, this very day, according to the author, who was John, which, by the way, hilariously, if you didn't catch it, here's what he says. The one Jesus loved, by the way. Yep. <laughs> uh, the one who outran Peter, by the way. Again, in verse 8, and finally, it says, finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first. And I think as he was pinning it, he's like, hey, man, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put that in there. I was faster. <laughs> I think God's like, it's fine, just... We'll still make the point. He's like, no, 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 I just, I just want to say this. But he said it like three times. I love it. How did he believe? It says he saw and believed. Saw what? He saw the combined evidence of the removed stone, an empty tomb, the linen wrappings, and here's what's crazy, the folded and separate head cloth right there. And he, I think he did the math, and he's like, I, I believe he rose from the dead. Dang. So the first recorded believer in the resurrection right there, I wonder how he felt. Like, I, we got to go find him. What's he doing? Where is he? And that math, not the same exact math, added up for me one day. When I was 18, I'm like, I believe. I think this is for real. And man, I was running 100 miles an hour the other way. And I'm like, no, no, everything I thought is just wrong. And this is right. And I turned and believed. And it changed everything. There's no way I would have ever thunk, is that a word? I don't care. 
that I would be up here preaching an Easter message at the same time in Tays Valley my brother is and my son just played drums. That's God. That's Jesus calling my name out and I said, okay, I'm, I'm sick of running. And I said, yes. That might have just added some time to my sermon. Sorry. But I said, I believe and I'm in. So he saw, let's look at Mary. It's the last part here. Um, verse 11. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. I want to stop there because is this going to work here? Yeah, I should have a bottle. Uh, think about this. The head and the foot, it, I think this is significant. Here's why. I, I think it's, it's a picture of, okay, Jesus' body was once a corpse, completely dead, laying motionless, lifeless on this horizontal slab on planet Earth. That, that actually happened for roughly three days-ish. And he entered into the human experience, even to the worst of human experiences, which is death itself. Like, this is no hoax. He actually died. He hung on the cross, died, and they put him in a tomb dead and gone. But he wasn't because... Okay, so verse 13, they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they had put him. Why did she think this? Because she did what? She assumed. You know what assuming does, right? It makes a, an assumption. What did you think I was going to say? Jeez. I would never do that. Well, back in the day, I probably would have. Uh, at this... She turned around and saw Jesus stand there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Why did she probably not realize it was Jesus, maybe? Because she assumed. There's no way. It's got to be somebody else, right? Okay, verse 15, he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Okay, so we saw how John believed. He saw. How did Mary believe? L listen to what happened. You know, she, she didn't recognize him for some reason. Again, why is that? May, maybe, here's a lot of theologians that I kind of read a bunch of stuff on this. Here's some things that they thought. Maybe it was her tear-swollen eyes. Maybe because it was early in the morning. Maybe it was the shade and the ambiance of the garden. Maybe her eyes were actually just weakened by God, and that wasn't for her to see right then. I don't know, but I mean, neither do these theologians either. They weren't there. I care how smart you are, you weren't there. I don't know. Here's what I think. She assumed that this is impossible, so her mind went everywhere else. But I don't know. Then it happens. He says, Mary... And everything changes. The shortest and most significant sermon ever recorded changed her life. One word. She went, oh. It's amazing. And she turns around because Jesus. it's getting weaker, guys. She'll be getting better. So I believe Mary at this point is sort of all, sort of represents humankind. Just by our nature, we kind of go our own way. We're trying to figure it out. We live kind of however we want. As far as she knows, Jesus is done and gone. As far as the disciples know, I mean, they all went back fishing. They went back to their old jobs. I mean, he's dead. Mary's crying. She's lost. Not sure what's going on. She's asking the question, like, what now? It's the way I was at one point in my life. Walking the other way, trying to figure it out. What's the point? Why am I here? Is this it? Is there something more? And maybe, maybe that's where you are right now, I don't know. But see, for Mary, that one word changed it all. The greatest word in the vocabulary, her name. 
And we know that too. If you're in a crowd and you hear, Steve, you're looking. You, if you're a mom or a dad, you know you look. You, you look. You're like, is that my kid? I hope not. <laughs> right? You, 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 you look, man. He said Mary and boom, her eyes were opened immediately. Listen to this. This is kind of cool. Here's the other thing I think is it says in John 10, which we're going to look at the next several weeks in this series. It's going to be really good. It says the good shepherd calls his sheep by name. And his sheep know his voice. Mary. Oh. Changed. Immediately. Dale Bruner uh, is a really smart guy. Um, and he wrote this about this turn. Listen, this is really cool. It says this. In the one or two seconds this turn took, I imagine the world shifting ever so slightly on its axis. And about... This turns one second midpoint trajectory, kind of like there, right? History too moved almost imperceptibly from BC, before Christ, to AD, after his death. A second before this turn, there's a woman in the deepest human despair in the agonizing presence of inconquerable death. A second after the beginning of this turn, there is a woman in the deepest possible human elation, in the presence of the death-conquering central figure in all of human history. Wow, that's pretty well written. All that happened in one turn. So Mary, the first to experience the personal presence of the risen Lord Jesus. She believes when she heard her name. John believed when he saw the empty tomb. The ten apostles believed when they saw the Lord's wounds. St. Thomas, Doubting Thomas, you heard of him? He believed when what? He touched the wounds. He believed. What was it for you? Can you remember? When was it for you that you, you turned? So I, I'm in. Have you had that experience? Because with all these assumptions made, I think one major assumption that we as humans, this is where I was, this is what hindered me from turning, is we make all these major assumptions that keep us from experiencing Jesus. I assume he really isn't the answer. I, I assume he really isn't what I'm looking for. I mean, this is silly. It's religion. It's whatever. I assume that, that this isn't for me, that I, that I don't understand it, that, that it's something else. I assume that I've done some things that just disqualify me, frankly. You know, like this morning, I'm here. It's Easter. I, somebody made me come to church. Just I'm being honest. I don't belong in the church. You, you, we believe these things. We assume these things. So I gotta be honest with you, if, if that's you, I'm gonna tell you, as crystal as I can, you're wrong. 100% dead wrong. Scripture says Christ died for the ungodly. The book of 1 Peter says he died the righteous for the unrighteous. Look at, the apostle Paul assumes some things about Jesus too, and look what he ends up writing. Just, one, just a couple verses, it says, for I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. Paul, being a persecutor of the church, becoming its proclaimer. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead changed Paul's life. It changed my life. I get to experience life to the full now and forevermore. Something way better, way more. That can be you, it should be you. Or here's the thing, are you ungodly? Are you unrighteous? Perfect, you qualify. <laughs> are you really bad? Then you qualify even more. For my grace is sufficient. Don't believe the crap that you believe in. Man, believe the truth, God came for you. He died for you, and if you were the only one, he still would have let you pound the nails in, and he would have rose from the dead for you. If you were the only one on earth, because he loves you. Don't believe anything other than that. It's killing you, literally. All right, where am I? 
See, we assume when we hear scriptures, like you hear this following at, at a funeral every now and then. It's something that Paul wrote too. But we hear, ah, it's a funeral scripture. Here's what it says. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through Christ Jesus our Lord. So we not fear, we don't have to fear death. Death no longer has the final say. I mean, the empty grave is like the exclamation point. The empty grave matters because, he's risen. yes, he's risen. So if, if we're prone to assume stuff anyway, let's start assuming stuff like, hey, nothing's impossible for God. That's what angel told Mary. I will do immeasurably more than all you can ask or imagine. That's what Paul prays in Ephesians. Is anything too hard for the Lord is what it says to Abraham and Sarah in the book of Genesis. If God is for me, who can be against me? So I keep praying, I keep asking, I keep having the faith because none of that's empty because there's a God alive on the other end of that line listening and saying, yes, I, I want to hear this. He's listening every day, all the time to all people, nothing he can't do. He can handle your sin, he can handle your chaos, he can handle your mess, he can handle your anger, he can handle your relationships, he can handle your money situation, your fears, he can handle everything, he can handle your doubts, he can handle your unbelief. There was a man who had a son, a dad, and his son was just being destroyed. And, and he's there in the presence of Jesus, and he says, man, do you believe? And, and the guy says, if you can, will you help us? And Jesus says, if I can, do you believe? And he says this, yes, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. I love that truth. Because sometimes I, I, it's hard, right? It's like, ah, yeah, I believe, but gosh, that's tough. That's a big one. He wants nothing more for you to turn around. Just, man, I, I got a life for you. That's what he wants more than anything. I've seen it. I've experienced Honestly, I could write a book on it. And it's not me. It's he did all of it. I, just don't you want that in your life? I mean, I'm talking a for sure thing. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, God being like the genie in a bottle. You know, your wish is my command. I mean, that's like Christina Aguilera or whoever. I'm talking, what if God actually flipped the script on that? In other words, your, com your command is my wish. Think about that. You turn and you begin to follow Christ. You begin to follow God. And guess what? The desires that you have or the desires he has for you because he made you. And then as you pray, you begin to pray for the things that he's actually doing in your life. That's why scriptures can say, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. Right? It's not, it's not genie in a bottle. It's like, no, no, because as you're following me, you're going to understand how you're made. I know how you tick. I know how many hairs are on your head or lack thereof. Chris, or, right? I know how you tick. Gosh, would you let me in? Because I got some good stuff to talk about, to tell you. But you got to turn. You got to turn. Stop going your own way, man. You can stop right now. Stop running right now. Stop. Turn. Psalm 139 says a lot of stuff says you were created in the inmost being. God created you in your mother's womb. It says he knit you together. Wow. It says he saw your unformed body. He knows your name. Your frame was not hidden from him. All the days written in your book I knew all of them before they came to be. That's who God is. So I'm saying if he really made you, don't you think it was for a reason? And don't you want to know? And again, maybe, as Matt said, we want to help you take your next step. Maybe your next step is to right now say, I believe. 
Easter Sunday, 2024. I just, everything I know of God, I said, I'm in. I believe that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray for us here. And what I'm gonna pray a prayer that I prayed in my dorm room in 94. It was a clunky prayer, I'm sure. And if, man, you feel a tug on your heart, we're gonna pray together. Pray it in your heart. I, I mean, I'm really, I'm honestly, remember I said, Jesus says in the very, I am the resurrection and life. Do you believe this? If you believe that, let's go. <laughs> let's really start living. So that's something that's on your heart and you have not done that. I'm just going to give you the opportunity because I, 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 I can't not. <laughs> right? So I'm going to pray. Pray with me. And you can say whatever you want. By the way, he can hear all of our prayers all at the same time, all, all the time. Doesn't matter because he can do anything. So you can pray your own prayer or you can repeat after me. But let's pray. And then we'll be out of here. Lord, I believe. <laughs> That's a great prayer. I believe, Lord, that you, you died and rose again for me. I'm done running. I'm just done. I don't even know what this really means, God, but I want you. I know that you made me for a reason. I want to know what that is. I totally trust you. I am really unrighteous and ungodly and all those things, so it seems like you are the reason. You are the answer. So I just give all that I know of myself to all that I know of you. I'm in. I'm in for good. Amen.